the first speaker in this session will be Gertu Palginum. Gertu is a good colleague of ours, and uh, Gertu is an art historian. She has uh, uh, researched very uh, thoroughly the um, um, uh, the material culture of the Burgundian Netherlands or Netherlandish art of the 15th and 16th century. And Kertu has also uh, defended her dissertation on that subject, uh, mainly focusing on the research of uh, St. Mary's altarpiece uh, of the Tallinn Brotherhood of the Blackheads. So she knows this object extremely well. And uh, 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 what is uh, very interesting with Kertu's approach to her uh, um, um, study is that uh, uh, the, she, she, uh, uh, she researches the, the uh, materiality that is depicted uh, on these material objects. So it's like a twofold uh, uh, dealing with the material culture the objects themselves as a representative of a luxury or the luxury items and also the luxury items and the materiality that is represented on them. So, but today, Gerto is not going to talk about uh, St. Mary's altarpiece, but, uh, but uh, she is going to uh, talk about the passion altarpiece. And uh, um, I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, glad because of that, because when we started the research project, uh, uh, putting the altarpieces in dialogue, then, then one of the aspects uh, we started and we considered very important was to, to um, consider uh, the objects uh, uh, like holistically and or treat them holistically, like with their, um, uh, with their integrity and also with their history. But, uh, uh, but I do I have to admit that, that now in this exhibition, the passion altarpiece is kind of uh, included only with the outer sides of, uh, um, uh, with the paintings on the outer wing. So, so I'm glad that Gerto now takes a closer look at what is uh, 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 depicted on the inner side of it. And Gerto will speak about uh, 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 the view of Jerusalem that is depicted um, uh, on this uh, retable and also the link to the uh, Franciscans. Thank you. Gertrude, the floor is yours. Dear colleagues, thank you for making this uh, possible and uh, giving me the opportunity to be part of it. Uh, this presentation is based on an article to be published in uh, the near future. Jerusalem, the holy city and the navel of the world, a simultaneously terrestrial and celestial topos with a vast connotation, has re frequently been depicted on maps, paintings, manuscripts and graphic art, as well as described in pilgrimage and other literary accounts. It has served as locus communis, or a common place, where the shared past of Jews, Christians and Muslims has become most evident. Christians worship Jerusalem as the ultimate pilgrimage destination, as the site of the Passion of Christ. For Jews, it reminds them of the first temple of the wise King Solomon, and for Muslims, it is the, it is the place of ascension of Prophet Muhammad to the heavens. In 1470, Jan Adornas, a notable member of a Genoese merchant and banker family of Bruges, with important ties to the Burgundian court, reaches the city of Jerusalem and describes it in his own words. The ancient city was so full of remarkable buildings that those who listened to the description of their beauty and their elegance could not feel but sharp pain. These are the sentiments we share at the moment about the Middle East. 
In addition to the Adornes family, for whom to visit the city of Jerusalem was a family tradition, notable Bruges artists like Jan van Eyck, Petrus Christus, Herhard David, Hans Memling, and Adrian Isenbrandt depicted Jerusalem and, uh, on their altar bases with varied accuracy. The Jerusalem depictions were a general phenomenon and was also evident in the works of other notable early Netherlandish painters, such as Rohia van der Weyden. The city view accompanied mainly the depictions of a nativity of a passion of Christ, especially the crucifixion. This presentation focuses on representations of Jerusalem in literary and visual sources, and it's particularly focused on the passion altarpiece, probably commissioned from the workshop of Adrian Isenbrandt or Albert Cornelis. The passion altarpiece, boasting multiple ties to Jerusalem, as well as to the Hanseatic network, was destined for the merchant city of Tallinn that had its own Jerusalem holy sites and chapels. Both milieus have been contributing to the iconography of a passion altarpiece. The history of the altarpiece rather, is rather complex as it has gone through alterations like overpainting done through the course of several centuries. So this presentation does not focus on the sit of layer of the altarpiece, instead it focuses on the original altarpiece produced in the 1500s. My analysis of a passion altarpiece takes the city view of Jerusalem as a point of departure to shed light on the complex history of our global past, on the axis of Jerusalem, Bruges, Tallinn. In order to better understand the altarpiece in the context of these cities, I explore the Franciscan aspect of the altarpiece through the significant role that the order played in curating the Jerusalem experience for pilgrims. I then move to describing and analyzing the Bruges and Tallinn context and the significance of the city of Jerusalem for both to discuss the altarpiece in this uh, framework. The central questions posed in this presentation are, what kind of visual means additions, omissions, and distortions were used to depict Jerusalem on the altarpiece. How does this depiction relate to other city views in the late medieval uh, Bruges and early Netherlandish painting in general? What was the role of the Franciscans in creating the Jerusalem experience, both on site and as part of mental pilgrimage? And how did it affect the passion altarpiece, which after all was commissioned for a mendicant church? How did the Bruges and Tallinn ties to the city of Jerusalem contribute to the understanding of a passion altarpiece? Could the depiction of Jerusalem serve as a point of departure for understanding the altarpiece in more general terms? The Jerusalem city view on the altarpiece has neither been an object of special attention nor has it ever been linked to a special taste and position of the Franciscans. On the one hand, sources on the Jerusalem sites in Tallinn are scarce, on the other hand, those sites of worship uh, or chapels have never been discussed together with the Passion Altarpiece. Thus, my aim is to show that the Franciscans had a special role in curating the experience of Jerusalem for pilgrims, and that this is explicitly reflected by the city view and passion scenes on the altarpiece. The initiative for this kind of depiction may have come from Livonia, possibly mediated by the Franciscans, or from Bruges, a city familiar with pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Both Bruges and the cities of Livonia had a special relationship to Jerusalem that played a, a role in depicting the holy city. Literary and visual material helps to describe how Jerusalem was imagined in late medieval Flanders and Livonia. The visual and literary sources used as a framework for the Tallinn altarpiece mainly come from Bruges. One such superb source is a pilgrim's book by Jan Adornes, who went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Adornes' descriptions of Jerusalem demonstrate the importance placed on different holy sites. The Jerusalem depiction by the Netherlandish painters helped to understand the convention of the city views at the time. Some of the views reflect, reflected reality to some extent, and some were partly imagined. In both cases, special attention was often paid to the Temple of Solomon. These depictions are used for comparing recurring motives, omissions, distortions, and additions. The Holy City, Jerusalem, went through various changes and suffered partial destructions up until the 16th century. 
This means that the holy sites of Jerusalem, among them prominently the Temple of Solomon and the Church of Holy Sepulchre, which enjoy a central position in the literary and visual sources, did not escape unscathed. Traditionally, the Temple of Solomon was begun in 1959 before Christ. The temple features in the Old Testament with detailed descriptions of its exterior and interior. However, by the time the Passion Altarpiece was painted, Mount Moriah had changed significantly. For Jerusalem, including the legendary temple site, had been pillaged and destroyed by the Babylonians and the Romans. The Temple of Solomon was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar, and the second temple, which was later overhauled into a grander one by King Herod, and which was known for Jesus Christ, was destroyed by the Romans. Since Jerusalem fell into the hands of Muslim invaders in 1628, new structures were built in the temple precinct, as well as on the site of the prophet Muhammad's ascension. The earliest Islamic buildings in Jerusalem, the Mosque of Al-Aqsa and the Dome of Iraq or Kubata Sakra, for example, were constructed on the site of a temple. Although these structures were rebuilt and altered over time for different reasons, they were the sites of worship the 16th century pilgrims would probably have encountered on their journey to Mount Moriah. Barring the fact that access to those Muslim sites was actually denied by the Mamaluk rulers. However, some literary and visual accounts suggest that they were not closed off entirely. For example, if we read the pilgrim's account of Jan Adornes, we encounter the following passages. So he writes, it encompasses a large number of Moorish mosques, the largest of, of uh, which uh, is, uh, is to be found um, on the site where Solomon's temple was once built. There are still a few walls of the ancient uh, temple left, the impressive dimensions of which attest to the ancient grandeur. If you want to have an overview of a city and the temple to which, is, to which one is not allowed to enter, Ascend to the Mount Olives, preferably at night, in the moment of a Moor's prayer, and you will see the shine of lamps of almost infinite number inside the temple. On another occasion, he writes, Firstly, we saw the holy temple of the Lord, built by the Solomon in the past, and almost completely destroyed. We even doubt that there is anything left of the earlier temple. Let it be enough for us to know that this was a place where the temple was built. God accomplished many great and extraordinary deeds there. Although the early Netherlands painting generally lacks those contemporary depictions of Jerusalem, there are still notable exceptions. One of them is a prominent Free Marys at the tomb from uh, Jan van Eyck's uh, workshop. Some believe that uh, he may have taken part of a secret mission to the Holy Land in the entourage of Philip the Good in 1426. It remains unclear whether he actually visited those sites, but his Rotterdam painting displays some of the landmarks of Jerusalem at the time, the octagonal dome of a rock and the Holy Sepulchre. This painting is rather an exception to a rule. It is also uh, possible that the depiction on the Rotterdam panel was derived from early examples such as maps, sketches, and manuscripts, like the Père uh, de la Plonquillère's uh, travel guide made for Philip the Good. The miniature in this manuscript depicts the same holy places, the Dome of a Rock and the Church of a Holy Sepulchre. Both may derive uh, from a shared model. Although Jerusalem was an oft-recurring and integral part of the scenes of Nativity and the Passion of Christ in the works of Bruges painters like Jan van Eyck, Petrus Christus, Herat David, or Adrian Isenbrandt, they lack references to the period-accurate city. This has been explained by suggesting that painters tended to rely on the former pictorial tradition or were using a confused mixture of literary and visual sources. For example, the Muslim mosque was confused with the Temple of uh, Solomon. Just as contemporary city guides may not be the most reliable source of a city's history, the guides in Jerusalem back then did not want to disappoint the people who came so far and wished to see something extraordinary. 
Most of the city views of the Holy City in the 15th and 16th century are constructed with visual motifs familiar with Western European architecture, as uh, uh, Gela de Roque has shown. Three main pictorial conventions are used to convey the Holy City. Firstly, to stress that the city is ancient, antique, and uh, Romanesque architectural motifs such as arched windows, columns, pillars, and arcades are used. Secondly, in order to give it a more foreign, exotic, or oriental look, cupolas and onion-shaped rooftops are used. Thirdly, in contrast to the former two possibilities and to make the city more familiar, the city view was structured in accordance to, with the experience of any Western late medieval city. All the features discussed above are found on the Passion Altarpiece of Tallinn. The city view is part of the Passion scenes. The open view starts with the carrying of a cross on the right wing, culminates with the crucifixion in the central panel, and ends with the deposition on the left wing. The donors on the left wing and the central panel date to the 16th and 17th centuries and are therefore much later additions not to, discuss, uh, not to be discussed in this presentation. The crucifixion includes crucified Christ on the cross in the middle, kneeling Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross, and mourning Virgin Mary on one and John the Evangelist on the other side. Behind them is a detailed city view. The mountains and hills at the blue horizon convey a distant land with unfamiliar topographic features. The city is enclosed with a wall with mighty towers and gates, reminiscent of Romanesque defense architecture. The houses inside the city walls resemble the buildings uh, of northern and western Hanseatic cities. The central building is the Temple of Solomon, with four stories and possibly a lantern. The ground floor comprises an arcade supported by a colonnade of double columns. Even though the Temple of Solomon is, is thoroughly described in the Bible, none of these descriptions cor correspond to the depictions found on the paintings. In this, it rather resembles a Roman Colosseum than the legendary Temple of Solomon. Mm -hmm. uh, none of the architectural features have anything in common with the Muslim sites visible on Mount Moriah and the city of Jerusalem of the time. However, they re rely quite heavily on the tradition formed by the Netherlands painting. Painters. This also means that the city view does not confuse the Muslim sites with the Temple of Solomon. The central plan building is featured in the works of uh, many Netherlands uh, painters. However, there is another feature on the altarpiece that brings the real life Jerusalem nearer to the viewer. It is the friary of a Franciscan order. The Passion Altarpiece in Tallinn was probably originally created for an altar in the Franciscan church in Livonia. The donors are unknown, the coat of arms have not been found with technical analysis. As the altarpiece is housed in the Nigerlisti Museum and its presence in St. Nicholas Church in Tallinn dates back to at least the 16th century, it could have been meant for Tallinn from the beginning. The problem arises from the fact that there, there was no Franciscan church in Tallinn. In Livonia, there were Franciscan monasteries and convents, for example, in Tartu, Viljandi, Rakvara, or Riga. The effort to found such a friary or convent in Tallinn were futile. Already in 1324, Pope John XXII gave permission for the founding of a Franciscan monastery or convent in Tallinn. In the uh, 1490s, the Archbishop of Riga, Michael Hildebrand, tried to convince the town council and bishop to found the Franciscan friary or convent, but did not succeed. In the beginning of the 16th century, uh, initiated by, by the Teutonic Order, the plans became more important again. The town council, however, did not go along with the plan, indicating that Tallinn had enough churches and monasteries. It is likely that the Dominican Order played a part in this uh, decision. The Passion Altarpiece, in its original iconographic program, featured four Franciscan saints in closed position, St. Francis of Assisi and St. Anthony of Padua, and left on the left, and St. Louis of Toulouse and St. Bernardino of uh, Siena on the right. These saints would have been visible when the altarpiece was closed. This was confirmed by the x-rays performed in Moscow in 1963, and uh, the 
infrared uh, red, uh, analysis taken by the conservator of Art Museum of Estonia, Olar Nurksa, in 2004-2012. All four original Franciscan saints may have been overpainted in the Italian workshop of Michal Sitov in the 1520s, as we believe. The specific uh, Franciscan program is the reason for assuming that the altarpiece was meant for a Franciscan, uh, Franciscan monastery. This could also mean that it was originally meant for a city other than uh, Tallinn. There is another indication of the Franciscans on the old Tallinn altarpiece. It is the complex of buildings uh, depicted on the central panel of the open view on the right side of the depiction of Jerusalem behind the crucifixion. This is not just any Franciscan monastery motivated by the depicted saints. It is the Monastery of Zion in the care of observant Franciscan friars near Jerusalem. In Mitzi Kirkland's words, they were the only representatives of a Latin rite allowed a presence in the Holy Land who, and who were charged with the care of many of the Christian holy sites. Taking care of the pilgrims of Jerusalem, accommodating them and curating their visits to the holy sites, the Franciscans had a, an important role in Jerusalem. They were the first to greet pilgrims at the port of Jaffa. The Franciscans also guided pilgrims through the city and accompanied them back to the port. This me meant that the pilgrims' experience of a city was entirely structured by the Franciscans. They had the power to decide what was and was not to be shown. The friary itself was located near the gate of Zion. On the central panel of a passion altarpiece in Tallinn, a dark green forest separates a friary from the city, but a closed gate invites two nearing Franciscans to the monastery. We can deduce that although the city view does not correspond to the period accurate Jerusalem and does not take any known buildings as its model, the inclusion of this structure still shows that the workshop was aware of a site in Jerusalem and the involvement of the Franciscans in the process of welcoming and guiding pilgrims. We may assume two possibilities. Either the Livonian Franciscans, who clearly outlined the program with the four depicted Franciscans, also stipulated the inclusion of a friary, which was given a Western architectural form by Adrian Isenbrandt or Albert Cornelis' workshop. Or as the information about the Jerusalem experience was at hand through the city of Bruges and its most notable pilgrims, the workshop itself was responsible for this inclusion. I am unaware of any other contemporary depictions of Jerusalem city views, including and emphasizing the role of the Franciscans to such an extent in the early Netherlandish painting. The physical space of Jerusalem was not conveyed on the altarpiece in Tallinn. However, there was another way of visiting holy sites, mental pilgrimage. Mental pilgrimage was not regarded as a poor substitute for visiting Jerusalem. Rather, it was encouraged as a more profound way of imitating Christ. What is more, the Franciscans were also great propagators of mental pilgrimage. A viewer standing in front of a passion altarpiece would have been encouraged to use their imagination to envisage the events depicted with all the relevant details and settings. The aim was to be mentally transferred to desired places. The technique was laid out, for example, in the very popular book, Giardano, Giardino de Orazione, or The Garden of Prayer. The book's ideas originate in the Franciscan thought, and particularly in the notion of locative memory, memoria locale, uh, which in simple terms refers to mediate, meditating on holy sites. If we are to look at on the altarpiece through this lens, the iconography becomes much more understandable. Although the traditional passion scenes are very widespread and at first seem completely standardized, it is still possible to define them in the framework of mental pilgrimage. Firstly, the journey starts with the carrying of a cross, with Simon inviting us with his gaze to engage with the suffering of Christ and take part in the journey. Then the pilgrim arrives in Jerusalem. They are visiting the Franciscan friary and the city proper with the Solomonic temple and the Calvary. 
On the left wing, the journey ends with the deposition bringing the potentially most important relics like the crown of thorns and the nails to the foreground, as well as inviting the pilgrims to contemplate the body of Christ also prominently displayed and in process of decay. The other figures, Virgin Mary and John the Evangelist, for example, also curate the viewer's response to the altarpiece. The Virgin Mary was of particular importance as she invited the viewer to contemplate her joys and sorrows. In this way, she became the model of emotional response and thus worthy of imitation herself. In the Garden of Prayer, the same procedure is prescribed to give shape mentally to the place, land and room where Jesus Christ talked, as well the, uh, as the people who were one by one in his company. The pilgrim was to imagine Christ's body and concentrate on its details, as well as to imagine Jerusalem with all of its small and grand holy sites and people connected to the passion scenes. It has been proposed that the famili familiarity of architectural forms used for the city view was more motivated by the earlier Victoria tradition than the pilgrim's accounts. But the Garden of Prayer encourages the pilgrim to imagine the holy city as if it would have been a city known to them with all of its familiar features. By the same token, they were to imagine holy persona as their good acquaintances. This means that the reason for the painter's indifference to actual Jerusalem was in part motivated by the devotional literature and convention. The more familiar the city, the easier it was to imagine and contemplate. It has been known for a long time that um, illuminated books of ours with their prayers and miniatures served as a medium for contemplation as did the small-scale devotional diptychs and grand altarpieces, such as uh, the famous Descent from the Cross by Rohir van der Weyden, they all encouraged the viewer and the reader to delve into the images and text and imagine the joys and sorrows of Jesus Christ and Virgin Mary. It seems that the Franciscan friars not only proposed that these specific saints in the Jerusalem monastery should be depicted on the altarpiece, but they also encouraged the viewer to make a mental pilgrimage to the holy places. In this manner, following in the footsteps of the friars in, in Jerusalem, the Livonian Franciscans actually took up the role of curating the, pilgrimage, the pilgrim's experience in Tallinn. But what was the role of Jerusalem for cities like, uh, like Bruges and Tallinn? Jerusalem played an important role uh, for Tallinn and Bruges, both merchant cities in Hanseatic uh, framework. The Adornas family, who were frequent pilgrims to the Holy Land, through generations built uh, the chapel of Jerusalem that embodied the Holy City in Bruges. It was this place that served as a starting point of a family's journey to Jerusalem. Further, Jan Adornas was not the only pilgrim from Bruges to leave an account on his journey, journey to the Holy City. Uh, and uh, it was not the only important pilgrimage uh, place in Bruges, as the city held an important relic connected to Christ's passion, um, uh, the relic of the holy blood. And uh, since the 14th century, a civic procession dedicated to the relic of the holy blood was carried out in Bruges annually on May 3rd. And the procession of the holy blood encompassed props and stages, among them a cityscape of Jerusalem as the backdrop for enacted passion scenes. Some of the paintings and drawings representing the Bruges procession <laughs> show the city as entirely transformed into the holy city. It was the painter's guild of Bruges that was entrusted with both the dramatization and the decorations of the holy blood place. This means that these painters were fully aware of the nuances of the holy city and the passion place to be enacted. The same amount of awareness or sensibility should be expected from the workshop, who probably took part of the same preparatory tasks. With that in mind, we need to consider that the motivation to depict certain features 
uh, such as the Franciscan Friar in Jerusalem, or the Passion scene, uh, scenes in great detail, as well as a close-up of the body of Christ, his suffering and various relics on the Passion altarpiece may have come from Bruges workshop, familiar with, with mental pilgrimage um, and the popular devotional pra practices of the day. Since Bruges identified itself with the holy city, the inclusion of a city view may be a reference to both cities uh, simultaneously. And now to Tallinn. Okay. Okay. In Livonia, there were several sites called Jerusalem that may have been places of worship, of chapels. In Tallinn, there were two sites outside of the city walls called Jerusalem. One of them was located behind St. Anthony and the other in the Fisherman, the place designated for the fishermen of Estonian origin. Several merchants bequeathed money to these sites. The Jerusalem of Tallinn do not appear in any known sources up until the 16th century. It is assumed that the Teutonic order initiated the founding of local Jerusalems. For example, there was a chapel of the Crusaders called Jerusalem near the town of Viljandi in 1599. Viljandi was a location of a castle of a Teutonic order, but also a location of a Franciscan friary founded in 1460s and dissolved in 1500s. No information of, on the furnishings of a friary or chapel survived. Still, if we are to believe that the Passion Autopiece may have belonged to another friary, Villandi is one of the places to consider. By the same token, the Autopiece could have been meant for the Mendicant Church of St. Catherine in Riga or, or, or the convent in Tartu. However, considering that the history of the Autopiece is complex and it has been overpainted numerous times, these possible reassignments would need a valid explanation. There were other examples of Jerusalem and Bethlehem holy sites uh, in or near Livonian uh, cities. For example, there was a, uh, one near to the Hanseatic town of Usparno. In the little town of Harpsalov, there was a Jerusalem street, which may have been connected to the chapel of the same name. It is, however, bold to assume that the Passion Altarpiece was once designated for one of those uh, churches. The overpaintings itself attest to the fact that the altarpiece lost its former relevance, which, which makes the version of altarpiece maybe made in advance for the Italian Franciscan friary um, the most uh, probable. The time when the steps were taken to found the friary or convent in Tallinn around 1500 and the time of their abandonment of the idea in 1520s correlate with the completion and the overpaintings of the Passion Altarpiece, uh, respectively. Yeah. Now that we have outlined the importance of the Holy City for Flanders and Livonia alike, we can better comprehend the entangled history on the axis of Jerusalem, Bruges and Tallinn, with the entangled motivations coming from commissioners and creators alike, it is a powerful testimony of a shared heritage of our global past. And my heart goes out to the innocent right now suffering from a war in the Middle East and in Ukraine. We cannot talk about Jerusalem and not mention that. Thank you.